Thank you for downloading the Start the Week podcast from BBC Radio 4. For more information, go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. Hello from Charleston and the Charleston Literary Festival. Charleston's the Sussex House, where Vanessa Bell, Duncan Grant and other members of the Bloomsbury Group painted, wrote, cavorted, talked, talked and then cavorted some more. The Bloomsbury Group is famous for complicated sexual arrangements and are now a byword for a certain kind of taste. Once advanced, a little European, but now bathed in nostalgia, in danger of being good taste. So it's fitting that with a live audience today, we're going to be talking about British taste and British sex, which is, this being Britain, also a discussion about class. Virginia Nicholson, Vanessa Bell's granddaughter and a writer on Bohemia, is with us. So too is the author of a new book on what Farah de Boivola calls the first sexual revolution in Britain, rather earlier than Bloomsbury, in the 17th and 18th centuries. Janice Galloway grew up during a later sexual revolution in a small town in Scotland, and what she calls her anti-memoir, All Made Up, analyses the ambiguous impact of it on generations of women. First, though, Grayson Perry, Turner Prize-winning artist, transvestite potter and creator now not only of huge tapestries but of three television films about the British and taste. Grayson, you separated these into working-class taste, middle-class taste, upper-class taste. How did you set about making these films? Um, well, we thought that class was the, was, the, was the most powerful force on taste. We could have done it with gender or age or ethnicity, but we decided to do it with class, and we went. We started off by visiting the places, almost the clichés. So we went for working-class taste, we went up to the northeast. we went to Sunderland, and then we went to Tunbridge Wells for the middle classes and the Cotswolds for the upper classes. And, of course... It isn't an equally divided society. In many ways, I could have made six programmes about the middle classes and one about the other two, in many ways. But because it, it, people now, the majority of British people think of themselves as middle class, and that can be a very wide sweep of our society. And you go to all sorts of uh, events ranging from uh, tattoo parlours and gyms where... Uh, working-class men are building up their muscles right through to a, a Jamie Oliver party where oh, yeah. people are selling Jamie Oliver Tupperware-type stuff to each other. Um, it seemed to me that the conclusion, the, the most important conclusion, is that you would say there is no such thing as good taste or bad taste. That Objective, might come as a shock to the, the audience here, I know. Because <laughs> <laughs> Ob objectively, your conclusion is that all taste is about... Uh, tribal belonging, class belonging or group belonging? Yes, I mean, I think taste is about not alienating your peers. It's about binding the tribe. And, of course, from outside of a particular group, you can sneer. So people, for instance, tattoos is a good example. People within who have tattoos see good tattoos and bad tattoos, but they're a kind of group of people who have tattoos. And then people outside, they hate tattoos, you know, because they're, they're appalled by them and they see them from the outside. And that's just a very clear example. But we're all members of a tribe. We're all bound by our little unconscious and conscious taste signals. And it's interesting to kind of... What I was interested to do was not to kind of do a design history or an anthropological study so much, but as to look at the emotion that informed... And each, each group has a different set of feeling, a scaffolding, if you like, which informs the taste. And because what happens is we, we grow up with, with our environment... And our taste decisions are we kind of marinated in the material culture of our of our age, and particularly with strong kind of communities like working class communities that grew up around heavy industry, that forms a really potent set of scaffolding, and so the taste is all kind of built up around that. And then there's this kind of so even though the the heavy industry is gone in the northeast, a lot of the kind of the, the sociological and emotional structures that were built by that industry are still there and they still need feeding almost. And that's mm. why the thing like the gym was fascinating. The guy admitted the gym the, where the guys all pumped iron, that was like a combination of working men's club and literally industry. They were pumping iron. Instead of smelting it, they were pumping it. And I thought that was an incredibly moving thing. I was very interested in how knowing people were, particularly in the working class film, about what they were doing. When um, people were doing the spray on tans, there was a lot of joke about how, how rich and deep the coppery colour had to be. 
And then you talked about the tattoos, and, and somebody was spending more money. They were spending more money on tattoos than people would spend on a painting to hang in a house. Uh, if they came from the liver, and, and they were they were very ready to talk about what their taste meant to them. Yeah, I think I mean it's it's in the British DNA. You know, we're kind of ironised to a certain extent. We you know our basic default mode is sort of um, pinpricking earnestness. We can't bear it. You know, come off it. They were saying so. Nobody nobody's fully engaged with it, and yet their default modes often is where their taste goes. So that's what's interesting. They can be aware of it on one hand, and yet also they buy into it because mm. it's a powerful thing. You know, you go down to a town like Sunderland on a Saturday night, and it is quite an exotic thing. And, and people, you know, they, they would rhapsodise the middle classes if they were in Africa and they were looking at some tribal ritual. Oh, yes, it was so local, you know, and yet... <laughs> These things are happening in all of our cities around the country. Yeah, you know, if, yes. if, you go to a, if you go to a hot car meet, you know, it's like being at some kind of exotic function. Yeah. And when it comes to the middle class taste, um, you, you sort of break this down into the um, uh, more artistic, sort of cultured uh, upper middle class um, who are quite self-conscious about quite uh, wanting objects around their houses which are rather old, they've found for themselves in second-hand shops and so on versus the people who've arrived in the middle class and want everything to, to work. To, they're really concerned about uh, everything in the house matching and looking, looking right. Yes, I think people you know, who are maybe less secure around their taste decisions, they want firm rules, they want brands, and they want a definite understanding of what is right, what is good taste. They're fr I mean, I met a woman who had bought the entire contents of the show home right down to the bathrobe hanging on the back of the door. And, 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 and I, I said, why would someone do that? And she said, well, there's a lot of choice out there and I could get it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and this is OK. Yeah. And I, I thought, good on you. You know, she had the confidence to admit that she was frightened of having bad taste. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, 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 there was another moment, I know, where you were... Because you try to... Whether you're dressing as a woman or as a man, you're trying to dress to fit in with mm. the people that you're talking to. And there was a wonderful moment where you're getting a blazer and some clothes, and you say, it's got to be a, a designer label, they say, yeah, but not too obvious. Yes. Just <laughs> tiny little bits of detail, yes. which will reveal that it's a Discreet designer label. Discreet branding. Discreet branding. Yeah. <laughs> and, so, I, I, and so you talk about the importance of tiny differences, small differences... Yes, the vanity of the small, vanity difference of small often. differences. And, you know, I, they dressed, I got various people to dress me up with varying results. Um, but it was fascinating. And that when I was dressed up by the two brilliant girls in Blue Water Shopping Centre who went, you know, they were looking for the kind of Paul Smith shirt with the slightly eccentric buttons, that, just a little clue. And yet you, you know, we went to a champagne and cupcakes party. And I think I passed. <laughs> <laughs> Someone said I looked like James Hewitt a bit, though. <laughs> And we should also explain, um, just before we open this out, what you did was, so you, you, you go, you talk to all these people, you make the films, and you're photo photographing all the time, and then you're drawing, and you create um, these huge, huge tapestries, which are both um, harking back to Hogarth, um, so I'd like to ask a little bit about that, but also have references to Renaissance painting and religious paintings. Yeah, because I'm an artist, and I, I, I felt maybe I felt slightly sort of exposed making a TV series. I, so I wanted to be in my comfort zone. So I wanted to make some art, and I thought that there was a kind of irony, I suppose, about making these grand tapestries about a commonplace drama of social mobility. And I've, I've woven all the my my kind of research about taste into a narrative about class mobility. So we've got a character that goes from a Sunderland birth through to buying a big mansion in the Cotswolds, and. Um, Hogarth, of course, it was, it was a good sort of model to, because his uh, famous group of paintings, A Rake's Progress, shows a, a man's journey through 18th century society. And I've tried to show a man's journey through 21st century society. Farah, later on we're going to be talking about your book on the origins of sex, which starts sort of 1600 to 1800, and therefore Hogarth is an important figure in this. Um, at that period, do you think that taste was equally about sort of tribalism and an anxiety to belong. Absolutely, and I think actually A Rake's Progress is partly centrally about that, and the, the rake, the character, is this aspirational libertine. He's not really a rake, he wants to be a rake, and that's what Hogarth is trying to satirise, and he shows in the background to all the scenes the furnishings that this man and his wife uh, use to decorate their home, and we're meant as, you know, knowing... Uh, tasteful 18th century 
uh, connoisseurs to see that they're all in the most appalling taste. I mean, on their mantelpiece, they have these hideous pottery, this hideous pottery, which is trying to be, you know, the most fashionable and failing. Uh, and his whole life is like that. He's trying and failing well, uh, uh, the, the standards of taste. I mean, I think we're sitting here at Charleston, which actually is perhaps, as you were saying, Andrew, uh, an, a, a, an emblem of contemporary taste now and has become adopted by a lot of people, a lot of the guests who come and visit Charleston, a lot of the visitors. But, of course, what one's really got to say about Charleston was that it was extremely pioneering at the time, that the house that you can visit today is covered in very, uh, very sympathetic but very colourful, very bold, um, very sort of libertarian decorations, um, whether it's the furniture, whether it's the fabrics, whether it's the ceramics, and it was a complete reaction against what came before. But, but th these days, Grayson, would you say there is a sort of Charleston stroke literary festival taste? I'm looking well, at I certainly went into houses in, in. I certainly went into houses in Tunbridge Wells where there was a lot of linen worn, and <laughs> and and there would be a William Morris wallpaper, and there would be a nice mid-century British painting against that. And I've included that in my tapestries because it was very iconic of a certain quite established middle part of the middle classes who have a lot of what I would call cultural capital. You know, they have a confidence around culture. It's about assimilation, isn't it? Mm. We've assimilated the bohemian criteria for taste and we've made it our own, um, despite the fact that it was absolutely pushing out the boundaries 100 years ago. Um, I, I'm wondering, therefore, Janice Galloway, I mean, a lot of, a lot of this is about um, anxiety to belong or fear of not belonging. Um, from a working-class background in Scotland, as a writer and so on, you're undoubtedly now middle-class, but I wonder what you're... Yes, you must be. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, taste... Uh... Everything is a, is, a, is, is a function of your own feelings of where you belong. Everything comes back to identity. I was fascinated to see in, in uh, Grayson's programmes, for example, that one of the things he wants to do is talk about class as well as what taste is. It also comes down to location. You chose very specific locations, none of which were Scottish, Welsh or Irish, which was, <laughs> which was very interesting to me. It was, it, was, it was about a kind of Englishness, a kind of observed Englishness, which is long overdue. And I, I, I found it very interesting to watch that because there were parts where I could chime exactly with what was going on and parts where I felt I was looking at the tribe from the Congo. Do you, th do you think we were doing that... other things? Uh, everybody had like someone to sneer at. I mean, I met two girls in a car park in Sunderland, which, which is not in the film, and I asked them if there was something they wouldn't do to their cars. And they said, yes, we wouldn't have those neon lights that you put under your car. They're proper chava, they said. <laughs> proper chava. And, yeah. So it sounds like a fizzy wine. But, yeah. but what, what, I, what I found was, even these people who I thought in many ways, you know, I have to say it, were at the bottom of the taste pile, that, 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 that they had someone to look down and I thought, oh, good on you, girl. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I make any value judgments no. whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> So what's the, what's, Grayson, what's the class makeup of people who buy your art? Is that determined uh, by class? The new super rich. The new international super, super rich. <laughs> <laughs> Virginia, you, 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 we started talking a, a bit about Charleston, but we haven't really talked for those who don't know Charleston and are listening uh, perhaps enough about it. Just explain, just describe um, briefly the house and, and the atmosphere and why it's such a special place. We're in the middle of the South Downs here. It's a um, hundred years ago when my grandmother moved here in the middle of the First World War. It was an incredibly remote and isolated primitive, freezing cold spot. Um, within days, weeks of moving in, my grandmother and her lifelong companion, Duncan Grant, started to decorate the house. And what you can see today is the accretion of 50, 60 years of artistic creativity on the walls, um, as in the form of paintings, but also in the form of textiles, in the form of ceramics, in the garden, um, in the furniture. And it's beautiful, it's eclectic, it includes all sorts of things that they picked up on their travels, it includes lovely objects of all kinds, it includes uh, fabrics, little lampshades that my, mother made, my grandmother made on her sewing machine, pottery that my father made here in his pottery... Mm. 
I was a child here in my summer holidays, so I remember sitting in the studio being painted for six months an hour. Um, <laughs> I would only do it if bribed. Um, but it was a wonderful creative house where really you felt liberated from the normal constraints. One of the things I felt um, in the past going round it was given that the Bloomsbury Group is so well known for the complicated nature of its sexual interactions, <laughs> the beds are very small. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, I think many Bloomsbury watchers know the uh, little phrase that has been commonly applied to them of a circle of friends who lived in squares and loved in triangles. Um, yes, the beds are quite small, and actually I think that the whole um, bed-hopping uh, notion has been a bit exaggerated. I don't want to get on the defensive about it. I think there was plenty of it. But maybe they just found more imaginative places to go, like the South Downs. <laughs> And it was a period when um, a group of people, and you could call them bohemians, you've, mm, you've talked about bohemia, this is, this is a little, little chapel or small castle in the middle of bohemia uh, that we're sitting in, um, but they did feel that suddenly lots of, of barriers to experiments in living had fallen down. Yes, I think, again, as a social historian, I'd be a bit careful about saying how suddenly it was. In a sense, the Bloomsbury Group were the crest of a wave that was already gathering towards the end of the 19th century with isms of all kinds starting to emerge in society, whether it was vegetarianism or feminism or pacifism or what have you. Um, but the Bloomsbury Group happened to come together at a moment in history and state their case. Uh, would you mind if I just read... A moment that is Go for it. very Go for um, it, sort of entered the annals of Bloomsbury. And this is a, a moment of Virginia Woolf, her sister Vanessa, and Lytton Strachey in a room together. The long and sinister figure of Mr. Lytton Strachey stood on the threshold. He pointed his finger at a stain on Vanessa's white dress. Seamen, he said. Can one really say it, I thought, and we burst out laughing. With that one word, all barriers of reticence and reserve went down. Sex permeated our conversation. We discussed copulation with the same excitement and openness that we discussed the nature of good. It's strange to think how reticent, how reserved we had been and for how long. And I think that's, um, if you like, a seminal moment. <laughs> <laughs> very, very good. <laughs> In uh, social history, in social, in absolutely. 1908. What a moment in the history of the country, I think, Virginia. <laughs> um, Farrow, we're going to come on to talk about what you call the first sexual revolution uh, in the moment, but it's, it's clear that sexual revolutions do come in waves. This was a very important moment too, wasn't it? Partly, presumably, created by the, the shaking effect of the First World War. I think um, I would say that the first sexual revolution is the most important, but it, 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 uh, and we can talk about why in a minute, but uh, it's certainly true that from the 18th century onwards, uh, the expansion of sexual freedom has uh, gathered pace, and I think our, after the First World War is certainly a moment at which you can see that in British society. Do you think it's inevitable, Grayson, that um, every sort of artistic period, and this is, this is a huge amount of creativity and experiment during the Bloomsbury period, uh, in writing and painting and so on, but it always becomes nostalgised. Yeah, uh, but men of my generation are already heavily nostalgising punk movement. I mean, I meet people who are, who are my age and they talk wistfully about the kind of going to punk gigs in their youth and, and they still hold kind of style, lifestyle tips about that sort of era and it, and it informs their whole outlook on life because... It, that kind of make do and mend aggression and politicisation, and, and especially now in austerity times, of course, they're holding a great deal of feeling for it. They would love to go back there and be angry young men again. Do you sort of slightly wince when you hear sort of Bloomsbury and Charleston talked about in nostalgic terms, that it's become a sort of nostalgic part of the history? Actually, I don't mind at all. I think that um, that's just a process that one goes through, and... It happens to just about everything. Um, actually, the Victorian era, we're now sufficiently remote from, and I think we're becoming remote from, from my, grandpa my grandmother's era. Um, we just incorporate it, don't we? It becomes mm. part of our lives. And in a sense, I would make the claim that we're all bohemians now. We were all started to adopt the, uh, the yeah. colourful walls and the pretty ceramics, and, and probably they're all doing it in Tunbridge it's Wells. Very, it's very hard work to be sort of rebellious and shocking nowadays. You've really got to work at it. That's why I, we, we're very professionalised now. <laughs> it's, very, it's very hard, and I think that um, 
the Bohemians had it easy in that sense at the beginning of the 20th century because they did have the Victorians to rebel against, who mm. were professional Puritans, many of them. <laughs> Farah de Boyavala, let's talk about the origins of sex, a history of the first sexual revolution, which is, I think, what will surprise people about this book, to start with, is the picture on the front, which is, which is from the uh, early 18th century, and this is a book which states that the sexual revolution that matters begins in 1600 uh, and, and runs through to 1800, far, far earlier than most of, us, most of us would have expected or assumed. So just paint a picture of what's going on in 1600. What is this a revolution against? Well, for most, it's a revolution against uh, what has been the status quo for most of Western history up until that point. Uh, until the 17th century, every Western society uh, punishes everyone for having sex outside marriage or tries to establish that sex within marriage is the only legitimate form of sex. And um, that process of indoctrination and policing and so on, we can, we can see that from the early Middle Ages right up until the 17th century, uh, getting stronger and stronger. It's never perfect, but by the early 17th century, there are many Western societies where uh, adultery is punishable by death, uh, where thousands of people every year are whipped and, and fined and imprisoned for having sex outside marriage. And this is not a case of a repressive government doing it to the people. This is a, case, this is a popular thing. It's a popular movement. Absolutely. It, w- it would never have worked if it was just some kind of top-down um, uh, church uh, imposition. People uh, internalise the view that sex outside marriage is dangerous and wrong, and the policing of it is a... There's no professional police. It's a matter of communities regulating themselves, coming together to uphold standards that they all believe in. Prying and spying and tipping off and sneaking. And all t- of that goes on a huge amount. You must have been a very, very determined person to try to have sex outside marriage in, in the world of the 1640s or the 1650s, or possibly just very rich. Uh, absolutely. I mean, cl- clearly, uh, yes, if you're rich uh, and powerful, you can get away with more. That's, that's true of all laws in all societies. But um, we can measure that this uh, indoctrination has a tangible effect. By, by 1650, only 1% of births are illegitimate in England. Which is an astonishingly low yes. figure. And then by 1800, the, the sexual revolution that I talk about uh, has taken place, 25% almost of all births, first births are, are yeah. illegitimate by then. So what changes and why? Well, the, the first thing that changes is that, that, that people start living in different ways. I mean, this is partly a story about the explosion of living in big cities. London, in particular, is at the vanguard of this. And at the end of the Middle Ages, only 40,000 people or so live in London. Most people uh, in, in the West live in tiny uh, rural communities where it's quite easy to enforce sexual and spiritual uh, conformity. And then by 1800, more than a million people live in London, and it's impossible uh, to Many of them that. young, they've, they've left their young, families they're... behind Absolutely. and they've gone... Yeah. And the other, thing, but the other very important thing is there's a shift uh, at this point from a, a basis in uh, faith as determining what's right and wrong, the basis in the church's teachings, in the Bible, uh, to uh, people starting to think that reason and conscience and private judgment should determine well, sex and morality. I was going to ask you about that, because I, I, c- can that be true? We, we know about the Enlightenment and how important it was, but it was very much a small elite movement. No, Did it no, really no, no, percolate no, 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 down no, to I'm the afraid, sexual behaviour of people? I'm afraid you're street? completely out of date, Andy. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> part of what Not my again. book is trying to show yeah. is that it's wrong to think of the Enlightenment as a tiny elite group of men kind of pontificating in salons and so on. Uh, we need to think of this as a, a social and cultural and intellectual movement that changes the way that everyone lives and thinks about things like morality. And, and the, the ideas that I'm talking about... So uh, what are the transmission mechanisms, then? Well, and how, they, they, how do people pick these ideas they, up? They, uh, they come out of, partly, the idea of sexual freedom, for example, is a very powerful idea, but it comes uh, out of... Uh, ideas about religious plurality, for example, that everyone in this society um, takes for granted by the end of the 18th century because um, of the toleration of religious plurality. And out of that comes the idea that uh, your spiritual conscience is more important at determining what's right and wrong about salvation. And people then start to develop that idea uh, in terms of other things that they start to think of as essentially private. If you, know, if you can decide for yourself... Uh, how to live and how to get to heaven, and no church and state can enforce rules of that kind, why should you not um, decide for yourself in other spheres of life? How do people pick up these new ideas concretely and directly? Okay. 
one thing that happens is that uh, there's a huge change in attitudes towards uh, whether men are more lustful or women. Uh, in the 18th century, is the first moment at which women start to write and publish freely. And uh, they talk about courtship and love in ways that are, uh, f- from, a, from a woman's perspective, um, uh, talking about seduction as something that men always try and impose upon women. These ideas are picked up and popularised in this new form of writing the novel, um, which is obsessed with interiority and uh, how people behave in love and courtship and so on. And the explosion of the novel and the way in which courtship and seduction are at the heart of that um, helps uh, spread these new ideas much more further down the social scale than they would ever have been. Ginia Nicholson. Yeah, the bit that puzzles me, Farah, is um, going right back, really. Um, What about Chaucer? What about Boccaccio? I mean, what about all that lusty, bawdy medieval stuff? (laughs) Plenty of people have sex outside marriage. Uh, but, but I mean, it doesn't century. come into Chaucer that they were, you know, whipped at the stake and sent off to be to the gallows, does it? Uh, not everyone who uh, has sex outside of marriage is punished, but it is the law. And if you look at the legal records through the Middle Ages, more and more people are being punished and horrible things are done to them. We mentioned um, sort of money and, and class earlier on. How much was this kind of punishment because they were breaking God's law? Yeah. It, was a, it was a religious and spiritual Issue and how much was it because once you don't know the genealogy of people and people are being born outside marriage, you're you're kind of messing up property law it, and money law. It's both. It's I mean it's overdetermined as we'd say. Um, uh, a lot of it has to do with fears about social anarchy, about how society would just break down if people had sex outside marriage and abandoned children and uh, um, didn't know who should inherit. Grace and Perry. You know, one thing I'm I'm thinking about for our book is that. The people who, you know, uh, who led this sexual revolution, I mean, they're like the, the rich men, basically, in many ways. It's a very unequal process. Yeah, yeah, they're absolutely. the ones that got to kind of, they got all the kind of good side of this. Yes. Sort of thing. And are, maybe, are we still reaping the kind of downside of it now? You know, I mean, if, if, it, if you follow the line all the way through and in the way that communication systems spread this kind of libertarianism, we're now, of course, got pornography on the internet, absolutely. which seems to me like the the natural conclusion of Yes, that. I mean, the last part of the book is about uh, all that and how, how modern ways of thinking and living that are born in the 18th century are very unequal, certainly to begin with, you know, freedom for men uh, and repression for women. And also, and the 18th century is the point at which people start to decide what's right and wrong on the basis of nature, what's natural. Yeah, that's a dangerous and, word, And that's natural. very dangerous. Exactly. Then. People can never agree, and it leads to terrible double standards. Janice Galloway. Yeah, just... You, 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 You've been talking uh, about about gender as a as a as a, as a possible way to, to come at this as well. I'm wondering how how much the poor, as it were, always got away with it, because again, t- talking about <laughs> places, Burns admitted his seven illegitimate children and paid for their upkeep, yeah. and nobody was much bothered. He sat in a thing called a ducking stool, and just kind of said, "I'm awfully sorry," and that was it. You know? Seven times. Seven yes. times. <laughs> that sorry again. was it. It doesn't sound like much for punishment because, to me, and well, it's, that it's is... partly because he had nothing to pass on. There was no inheritance involved. This seems to be intrinsically bound up with money and religion. It's part, yeah, absolutely, but it's partly also because Burns uh, is after the what I call the first sexual revolution. In the 17th century, people are still being hanged for adultery in Scotland, and indeed some of them are in England too. But, uh, but if I can just say, on the moral point, which you were asking Grayson about, mm. um, I think one thing one should say here at Charleston again is about the, the, these pioneering artists at the beginning of the 20th century one can mock and one can revile their sort of sexual hijinks and think how ridiculous it all was. But actually it was hugely informed by an ideology and by an ideology of love and art and friendship. And I think that my grandparents and their generation and the people that they knew felt incredibly strongly that this wasn't just about, you know, getting your end away and having a bit of, a, uh, a, a bit of fun, but that it was something very passionate, something that meant something very deeply to them. And that comes through again and again in their writings and in their art and in everything one reads about them. Well, this is interesting because they are presumably reacting to something that came after your book, Farah, which is the Victorian 
upturn on sort of sexuality. Mm. Um, their their parents yes. exactly in that the, 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 they oh. looked at Victorian marriage and said this is a degraded transaction. Yes, you're, you're. Um, what we should be living for is something outside marriage because we can we can be pure, we can be um, divested of all that, those sort of financial, commercial, uh, conventional trappings, and we a, can live a, for something higher, which is art yes. and love. But and that are, was their those, mantra. Those, are, those attacks exactly that that way of thinking is born at the end of the 18th century. Uh, and the, uh, the people who inaugurate it uh, are people like Mary Wollstonecraft and William Godwin and the great radicals uh, who so live around 1800. So the were very far from being the first. Exactly. Indeed. The Bloomsbury's are inheriting that as well mm. as kicking against the uh, Victorian repression yeah. uh, so we, that immediately precedes them. We've looked at different sort of waves of, of, of sexual liberation. Um, and I'd like to come up to uh, one of the more recent, the 1970s, um, Janice Galloway, because your what you call your anti-memoir, All Made Up, um, was very much about yourself, your sister and your mother um, reacting in different ways to the, to the, to the new mood uh, in the country. There were, above all, of course, there was the pill in those days. Um, but, but, but but still is, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> so I hear. <laughs> so I gather. Um, but you're quite... I mean, one of the points you're making is that um, what's supposed to be a, an era of sexual liberation feels very differently depending on your exact age at the time and where you are in the family structure and indeed where you are in the country. Where, where you are in the country, yes, we keep yeah. coming back to that with me. Um, where, to, to where you are in the country, it's where you stand on, on the landscape determines so much. It determines what you can see. It determines whether there's a hill in the way. It determines whether there is water in the way. It, it, it determines so much where, you, where you're from and what surrounded you and what was normal. And it never occurred to me that I was, for example, this, this phrase that's been bandied about, I don't know if it was the same for you, Grace, and that I was from something called the working class. Well, I used to... Recur, I had a sort of PC phrase, which is people of restricted taste. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have dreamed of coming out with that expression <laughs> in my background. But we, we were all very different. And I only started finding out, looking at genealogy, when I came to writing about what my family was. I wish I'd never called the thing an anti-memoir because it's, people stick on it. It just meant it was a novel. It was a true novel, is what I really wanted to call it. Everything that happened in it is true, but it's been kind of novelised because you pick and choose. Of course you do. And one of the things I found out and never used was that my granny was pregnant when she'd got married. My great-grandmother was pregnant when she got married. I'm from a long line of women who get pregnant and then see the point of marriage. <laughs> Getting pregnant was the key factor. And my mother was the same, and it sat with her like a terrible, guilty secret. And when I got pregnant at the age of 17, my mother had to be told. Because some things still come under English law, and although I could have been married and done and dusted at 16 in Scotland, I wasn't allowed to have anaesthetic. Oh. I had to have my mother's blessing to have the anaesthetic. And uh, she therefore had to be told. And I knew that that was the disaster was that what she'd been through, what my granny had been through, because my mother's mantra throughout her entire life was, don't have Wayne's hen, they ruin your life. <laughs> Which is hard to hear when you're six. <laughs> it's hard to hear from your own mother as well. <laughs> but I knew what she meant. Yeah. I knew exactly what she meant. And my, my sister was... was, 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 was was the one in the middle. It kind of worked out that we came from these different sexual eras, if you like. I was from the one that had the most breaks, allegedly. With every break comes a downside. There's no such thing as just a positive. It depends how determined you are to see the negative, whether you can find it. And I was pretty determined. I remember going to parties at the age of 17 where if you didn't, what was called get off which meant a number of things. It could mean any one of a variety of things. If you didn't get off with a boy, there was something wrong with you. And I remember when 17-year-old boys discovered the word frigid. What a fun time that was. <laughs> <laughs> my sister was 17 years older than me. The people in the street thought she was my mother because that, again, was part of the sexual mores of the street I lived in, of the place I came from, and I thought of the whole world. I thought if you had a child out of wedlock, you gave it to your mother. Everybody in the street thought I was my sister's. I was not my sister's. I was my mother's. But at the, I looked very like my father was one of the big clues. I always looked like 
I always looked like a man in drag, Grayson. I always looked like... So did oh. I. I was, I was <laughs> That's <laughs> not... That's not so, Jack. That is absolutely not I'm so. not looking for sympathy. I'm being brutally honest. I looked like my father. Now, what else? My sister, on the other hand, insisted she looked like my mother. My mother looked like Carmen Miranda. My mother was a looker. She was a bus conductress, and in her, in her uniform, she looked like a Coke bottle. You know, she was just <laughs> gorgeous. And my sister wanted the freedoms of looking gorgeous, because that meant hanging out with men, and they had the power, and they had the money, and they could show you a good time. <laughs> That was exactly what she wanted. The good time was becoming rather too frequent by the time I came along and trying to bypass all, all these different rules that we had. And, of course, my sister's methodology, which was to be a better boy than one of the boys. She could drink her boyfriends under the table. She invariably picked roughy, tufty men, and her greatest enjoyment was letting them know how little she depended upon them. She sat as though she was holding court, like Elizabeth I, with yes. boys round about her, and they would keep buying her drink. But, of course, it all came to rack and ruin because she got pregnant out of wedlock four times in a row. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the important yeah. thing about being a girl in a sexual revolution is whether you have the pill or not. Absolutely. Yes. I was going to chip in there because, of course, the sexual revolution that happened 50 years earlier than that with the, the Bohemians and with not just my grandparents but with a whole raft of sort of artists and subcultures and wannabes and all the rest of it um, was that it... Um, all sounded very fine and good, and it all sounded of a sort of art and love and all these higher ideologies. But of course, the women were the victims. And if you look at someone like Augustus John, who was the great sort of swaggering artistic Mick Jagger of his he day, he didn't stop. He never he stopped. Was, he they was lost, relentless. They lost count of how many children he'd fathered. Even his biographer Michael Holroyd doesn't know how many children he fathered. And he used to go up to women and say, "I'd like to make a baby with you." And, and they're none of them meeting the, at the bus stop the or truck, kind of pretty you know, much, yeah. in the post office. The problem is n not very many of them could resist because he had was like a sort of force of nature. And his poor young wife Ida died after at the age of 24 or 5 after five children absolutely worn out by his repeated infidelities and by childbearing and by housework and you've got to remember that they weren't that liberated these artistic men they actually expected the women still to be the ones who did the washing up and did the, did well, the child get on with rearing the well, and they the, got on and it's the... not surprising that my grandmother was one of the few decent you know, proper artists of the 20th century because she had just about enough money to employ a housekeeper and a cook. Absolutely. It goes back to Virginia Woolf, a room of your own. And, and, and 500 and a year and for those days. Year. The <laughs> money is Gra important. Grace and Berry. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, what strikes me about all this conversation about sex, really, and I'm thinking again, sort of linking it into class and the, and the handing down of taste... It's like, I always think about the children in these situations. Mm. We talk about the women being victims, but, of course, always... It's the, the children seem to fall out of this thing, and, of course, then they're left with the kind of emotional shrapnel from these kind mm. of... these sexual revolutions. You know, they're, like the, they're the people that end up in, in kind of emotional hospital after this thing. Yeah, exactly. and, I, and, I, and I kind of think that if you, if, you, if you had a child in charge of sexual mores, I wonder what they would say. Very interesting yeah, question, they, they, that. Janice. They ended up in more than emotional hospital. I mean, I know certainly I'm researching very, very wonderingly at the moment. I'm researching a lot of sex in the 18th century about a, for, for a, a book that I'm just about to write. In Naples, that was where they opened the foundling hospitals. And there was a door. You could bring a baby to a door, put it in, turn the door round, and the baby went through to the other side. And if it survived till morning, someone would pick it up and look after it to a certain extent. The mortality rate in these places, I think, was one in four. Small children got mm. the brunt of it. Small children always do, but then it's been that way right through yeah. history. I, I, I'm very interested in this point that Grayson's making about children. I'm thinking of somebody like Rousseau, the great sort of um, proclaimer of freedom and nature. Now, his children were sent off to... were, were just packed off to um, some kind of uh, home. He, he sent them to a foundling hospital, do, yes. do we know what happened to them? No, we don't, and nor did he. Um, and, you know, it is the flip side of sexual freedom and modern ways of living and thinking that um, many people get hurt, standards are never equal... Um, but that's what we grapple with. Yeah. If we some, say sometimes that these we're... revolutions are sort of pitched as if they're some kind of you know moral good force, and often they're like explosions that are thrown into stable homes 
And, you know, yes. they're very disruptive for people's real, ordinary, normal, in inverted all, commas, lives. All the, all, all the Nicholsons and, and so forth seem to have come out of this one, this particular explosion, rather well. Is that because it was a, a particularly well-off, um, uh, wealthy, sort of creative family? Do you mean family? the Bells, yes. And, um, yes, and the Bells, yes. Yes. Um, no, they didn't all come off well, and actually my aunt Angelica Garnett, who died um, less than a month ago, um, who was the illegitimate daughter of my grandmother Vanessa Bell and her gay lover Duncan Grant, um, suffered appallingly actually and was obsessed for much of her life with the fallout from her liberated parents' ideas and who actually kept secrets from her but at the same time uh, felt that it was necessary to, to you know, go their own sweet way ideologically and have children out of wedlock and all the rest of it. But I want to say, we all mess up. Um, you know, we're none of us perfect. And that if you take a punitive attitude towards people who want to sort of change things and push out boundaries, then I think there's a certain amount of prurience hypo and hypocrisy mm. going on there. Yes. Last, last thought from Farah. I think we have to remember all these problems arise in the modern world, the modern Western world, where we think sex is a private matter and for us as individuals to sort out. And I feel, still think sexual freedom of that kind is better than sexual repression by the state mm -hmm. and the church of a kind that used to persist in Western history until the 18th century, and that indeed persists around the world in many places today. Well, on this Jubilee weekend, we started um, by looking at taste, and we've pulled back the wallpaper, I think, a bit, and scratched away at the walls, and all sorts of things have been come tumbling out, which is a very British result. Thank you to all my guests, Virginia Nicholson, trustee of Charleston, and writer on Bohemia, Janice Galloway's anti-memoir, not an anti-memoir, now I'm going to call it a real novel, all made up, mm -hmm came out last year. <laughs> Farah Dabaivala's The Origins of Sex, A History of the First Sexual Revolution, is out now. And you can see All in the Best Possible Taste with Grayson Perry tomorrow night on Channel 4. And Grayson's exhibition of tapestries, The Vanity of Small Differences, is at the Victoria Miro Gallery in London from Thursday. Next week, we are back in the studio to discuss history with Anthony Beaver, Max Hastings, Juliet Gardner and Neil Ferguson. But for now... Goodbye from the Charleston Festival, and thank you all very much. It is an equally divided society. In many ways, I could have made six programmes about the middle classes and one about the other two, in many ways. But because it, it, people now, well, the majority of British people think of themselves as middle class, and that can be a very wide sweep of our society. And you go to all sorts of uh, events ranging from uh, tattoo parlours and gyms where uh, working class men are building up their muscles right through to a, a Jamie Oliver party where oh, yeah. people are selling Jamie Oliver Tupperware type stuff to each other. Um, it seemed to me that the conclusion, the, the most important conclusion, is that you would say there is no such thing as good taste or bad taste. That Object might come as a shock to the, the audience here, I know. Because <laughs> <laughs> Ob objectively, your conclusion is that all taste is about uh, tribal belonging, class belonging or group belonging. Yes, I mean, I think taste is about not alienating your peers. It's about binding the tribe. And, of course, from outside of a particular group, you can sneer. So people, the sociological and emotional structures that were built by that industry are still there and they still need feeding almost. And that's mm. why the thing like the gym was fascinating. The guy admitted the gym, the, where the guys all pumped iron, that was like a combination of working men's club and literally industry, they were pumping iron. Instead of smelting it, they were pumping it. And I thought that was an incredibly moving thing. I was very interested in how knowing people were, particularly in the working class film, about what they were doing. When um, people were doing the spray on tans, there was a lot of joke about how, how rich and deep the coppery colour had to be. <laughs> And then you talked about the tattoos and, and somebody was spending more money. They were spending more money on tattoos than people would spend on a painting to hang in a house uh, if they came from the liver. And, and they, were, they were very ready to talk about what their taste meant to them. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's, it's in the British DNA. You know, we're kind of ironised to a certain extent. We, you know, our basic default mode is sort of um, 
pinpricking earnestness. We can't bear it. No, come off it, they were saying. So nobody, nobody's fully engaged with it. And yet, in the 17th and 18th centuries, Janice Galloway grew up during a later sexual revolution in a small town in Scotland, and what she calls her anti-memoir, All Made Up, analyses the ambiguous impact of it on generations of women. First, though, Grayson Perry, Turner Prize-winning artist, transvestite potter and creator now not only of huge tapestries but of three television films about the British and taste. Grayson, you separated these into working-class taste, middle-class taste, upper-class taste. How did you set about making these films? Um, well, we thought that class was the, was, the, was the most powerful force on taste. We could have done it with gender or age or ethnicity, but we decided to do it with class, and we went. We started off by visiting the places, almost the clichés. So we went for working-class taste, we went up to the northeast. we went to Sunderland, and then we went to Tunbridge Wells for the middle classes and the Cotswolds for the upper classes. And, of course, for instance, tattoos is a good example... People within who have tattoos see good tattoos and bad tattoos, but they're a kind of group of people who have tattoos. And then people outside, they hate tattoos, you know, because they're, they're appalled by them and they see them from the outside. And that's just a very clear example. But we're all members of a tribe. We're all bound by our little unconscious and conscious taste signals. And it's interesting to kind of... What I was interested to do was not to kind of do a design history or an anthropological study so much, but as to look at the emotion that informed... And each, each group has a different set of feeling, a scaffolding, if you like, which informs the taste. And uh, because what happens is we, we grow up with, with, with our environment and our taste decisions are... We kind of marinated in the material culture of our, of our age. And particularly with strong kind of communities like working-class communities that grew up around heavy industry, that forms a really potent set of scaffolding, and so the taste is all kind of built up around that. And then there's this kind of... So even though the, the heavy industry is gone in the North East, a lot of the kind of... The Thank you for downloading the Start the Week podcast from BBC Radio 4. For more information, go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. Hello from Charleston and the Charleston Literary Festival... Charleston's the Sussex House, where Vanessa Bell, Duncan Grant and other members of the Bloomsbury Group painted, wrote, cavorted, talked, talked, and then cavorted some more. <laughs> the Bloomsbury Group is famous for complicated sexual arrangements and are now a byword for a certain kind of taste. Once advanced, a little European, but now bathed in nostalgia, in danger of being good taste. So it's fitting that with a live audience today we're going to be talking about British taste and British sex, which is, this being Britain, also a discussion about class. Virginia Nicholson, Vanessa Bell's granddaughter and a writer on Bohemia, is with us. So too is the author of a new book on what Farah Daboivola calls the first sexual revolution in Britain, rather earlier than Bloomsbury.